Good morning, everyone. Uh, you're very welcome uh, to this webinar. Thank you for joining us. Um, so in this session, we're going to talk about uh, the Vulnerable Person Analytics project that we delivered for Surrey County Council in conjunction with Kinos and Skyscape Cloud Services. So first of all, just to introduce who we are, so you can put some names uh, to the faces. My name is Tom Swan. I'm an analytics architect with Kinos Software. I was the uh, technical lead and leader of the de development team on this piece of work for Surrey. So I'll be talking a little bit about um, the actual process of delivering that solution um, and what the solution looked like. I'd like to introduce Logan Seeley, the local government account director for Skyscape Cloud Services. And Logan will be able to talk a little bit more about their secure cloud platform and um, how the solution was actually hosted. And finally, uh, Mark Edridge, Digital Program Manager for Surrey County Council. And I'm going to first of all hand over to Mark, and Mark will introduce Surrey County Council and just talk about um, some of the background into how we came to engage Surrey uh, for the Vulnerable Persons Analytics solution. Good morning, everybody. Um, I just wanted to uh, start with a little bit about um, how Surrey County Council is um, formed. So we're, we're a council that's a two-tier authority. Um, so there's us and districts and borough councils. Um, there's 11 within our boundaries. We also have uh, seven clinical commissioning groups for the NHS. Um, we have a population around 1.1 million. There's 474,000 households in the area. And without sounding like an advocate for the tourist board, um, there are some important infrastructure um, and some natural beauty spots within Surrey. So we have some motorways that serve connections between London and the south coast, uh, rail lines as well. Um, we have some infrastructure that serves two of the major international airports at Heathrow and Gatwick. Um, and, you know, like I said before, we have some areas of outstanding national beauty um, along the Downs and um, some historical important sites like where the Magna Carta birthplace was signed. Um, so that gives a bit of background to Surrey as a whole. Um, this is uh, Walton in Surrey. and. Um, and this is their kind of backdrop to the story for how we became involved with Kanos in the start. So if I just move forward to the next slide, you'll see that some of the land disappears in that picture. Um, in winter of 2013 and 14, we had the uh, highest rainfall we've had for 250 years in Surrey. Um, we ended up with flooding that affected 10 out of the 11 districts and boroughs um, and prompted a 12 local authority joint response to be able to respond to that flooding scenario. Uh, we were working alongside other partners. At one stage, we had 600 military personnel wandering around Surrey and helping us out. Um, and we had a number of Surrey County Council buildings set up as command centers to be able to respond to that flooding scenario. Now here we've got a uh, snapshot graphic which shows you the kind of geographical extent of some of those flooding problems that we had. Um, and the red areas on here are really the, um, the River Thames at um, dangerously high or record levels throughout the county. Um, just as a, a kind of headline figure, uh, since the Thames Barrier was opened in the 1980s, during this winter period of 2013-14, 25% of all the operational closures they've ever had happened during that period. Now, obviously, that had a huge impact on the council, both in terms of uh, geographical, in terms of infrastructure, and in terms of residents themselves. In December of that winter, we had 15,000 properties that had no power over the Christmas period. Um, our emergency planning, uh, along with the partners you see along the bottom of that slide, uh, was working on the assumption that we might have to evacuate 5,000 people from their homes. We set up makeshift rest centres for them to go to. We set up temporary defences along people's streets to try and keep the flood water at bay. Um, and in reality, what actually happened was that we ended up supporting people in their own homes more um, and distributing something like 20,000 sandbags in the process. Now, the impact on our residents was obviously felt at an individual and at community level as well. So one of the core functions for the coordinated response teams, which include fire and rescue, the military, council staff, the environment agency, voluntary groups, um, is all about supporting vulnerable people. We were working uh, on, a, on the assumption that at one point that we had 2,500 properties on high alert for evacuation. And as you see from the figures there, actually it was 1,431 that was affected in the end. But the support plan quickly moved from 
being about evacuating people to reaching people in their own homes and supporting them there. Um, it's something of a sorry cliche, but there was community help involved too, and there was a group of 74 4x4 owners who helped reach those people alongside some of those uh, agencies you see at the bottom, and they were nicknamed by the press as the Shepherds and Cavalry. So it really was a whole county council, uh, local council, um, national agency, and community response to the situation. But there are a number of lessons that we needed to learn out of this process uh, when we came to review our response. And one of the uh, actions out of the local resilience group was, was concerning our support for vulnerable people in this situation. Um, we had a situation where the, the scenario moved very quickly from being about evacuating people from their homes to supporting them in their own homes. And that was a difficult thing for us to achieve. Uh, the situation moves very quickly um, and we need a flexible plan to be able to respond to that scenario. Some of the challenges we face in doing that is, is gathering data from all the partners in the local area who hold information about vulnerable people. There are multiple partners across districts and boroughs um, who provide different services. Uh, within the county council we have different services provided for vulnerable people and a number of our NHS partners as well, um, from acute care to community care, who all hold information about, about vulnerable people. And in the event of emergency, we need to gather all of that information together um, and consolidate that and provide that to the people who, are, who need to plan and actually respond to those situations. Now the process for doing that at the moment is, is a best practice process and uh, it's facilitated by the Surrey County Council Emergency Management Team and they've got that down to within an hour they can gather that information in from the partners, consolidate it and distribute it out. But that's a very resource heavy approach and in order to be flexible we need to be able to account for, for doing that multiple times. Matching the data within that time scales can also be a difficulty where a person may be known to multiple services or multiple agencies. So for safety's sake, we might issue out information that has duplication in it, but that passes some of that, uh, that slows some of the response situations down. So these are some of the issues and challenges we try to pick up from a digital perspective to try and help with the action of making our vulnerable people plan a bit more flexible for these situations. In Surrey, we're going through a digital transformation at the moment, and we're building a platform strategy. Um, and the platform is really about creating lean and efficient processes with, throughout the council, focusing on common outcomes for residents across our different services and partners, and connecting with residents through digital channels. And one of the key aspects of doing this is realizing the value we have in the data that we all hold, um, and how that can drive dis uh, business decisions and business models going forward. And it's all really aimed at generating new outcomes for residents or different business models for achieving the outcomes that we already provide. We've embedded our digital approach, taking on a GDS type approach to the, uh, the, the local authority, but we've embedded it throughout the council. Um, we have a chief digital officer who works very well with our chief information officer, and we have digital and IT strategies that are joined together, and it's also embedded within our own corporate strategy. So following this approach, we felt that the flooding scenario and providing a better quality data response to that scenario would be um, something we could pick up as a digital exemplar and give us an opportunity to explore some big data technologies that we haven't really looked at too much within the council so far. Um, I think we're doing quite well. We got nominated for Digital Council of the Year this year. Um, unfortunately, we didn't win it, but um, hopefully there's time for next year. So in terms of issuing that project. Under the Civil Contingencies Act, Surrey County Council has a responsibility to prepare for emergency incidents within the county. We work with other agencies to assess the risk and ensure that emergency plans are in place or tested. And we train for uh, the response to those incidents on an ongoing basis. Uh, there are three levels of command when responding to emergency incidents and they require different types of information to be able to enable their type of planning. So we have the gold level which we're, where we're looking at strategic directors of different councils, chief executives who need to, to have a high level information to plan their response. At a silver level where we're looking at a more tactical response we've got the people who are centrally looking at detailed data and planning how we might be able to get people on the ground to respond to that scenario. And then the bronze level command is more of an operational so, for example, the Fire and Rescue Service who are responding to a, 
um, emergencies in the field and need information um, simply and quickly at the point of that response. So this is the scenario we were looking for in terms of how we can help with some of the challenges within responding to the flooding scenario. Um, and I'll hand back to Tom to talk you through how we met those challenges. Thank you, Mark. So before I talk about our solution and our delivery approach, I'll just give you a little bit of background to who KNOS are, in case you're not familiar with us. So we are a 700 person strong IT services company. Uh, we're headquartered in Belfast and we have offices throughout Ireland and the UK, uh, in Gdansk in Poland, and Boston in the US. And we deliver digital transformation using agile development. So I work within KNOS Software's big data and analytics practice. And our focus is very much on next generation technologies for managing data, for data discovery and visualization, and advanced analytics. So we're all about improving how customers uh, can make data-driven decisions. And so KNOS use a phased agile approach to service design and this um, very closely follows the GDS uh, pipeline. So moving through discovery phase to an alpha where we iteratively refine a prototype through to a beta phase where we build out a solution that can meet the demands of a live environment. So everything that we're going to talk about was achieved over an eight-week period uh, of an alpha. Uh, and that was four people, so four developers, working on site as an embedded team um, in the Surrey County Council office. And so just over the next few slides, I'm going to just talk about how we helped Surrey to define what that alpha looked like and how we actually delivered that solution. So the first step for us in delivering an alpha is to determine what the actual vision for the alpha is. So that's the, the kind of the first step, is to agree on this vision statement uh, and write this in conjunction with the customer. So the vision for the Surrey County Council uh, Vulnerable Persons Analytics Alpha was to aggregate data from three or more data sets and upon which we would define a sample set of criteria to allow vulnerable persons to be identified and located during an evacuation scenario and focusing on flooding in the first instance. So <clears throat> this vision statement goes up prominently on the whiteboard in the development team room. So what this serves as is a reminder to everyone of what the end goal we want to achieve actually is. So it focuses us on the core issues. So that is, what is the data that we actually need to identify that's going to allow us to build this list to identify vulnerable persons? And how best can we achieve this within the actual evacuation scenario? and all the constraints that that's going to imply in terms of time, in terms of people's availability, and so on. So throughout this process, our highest priority is really to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. And this again is very much based on the GDS approach, so where we focus on providing real value to real user needs. And what that means is really getting the people um, like Bryn here. Bryn is the fire chief from uh, the Surrey County Council Fire and Rescue Service. Uh, people like Bryn actually in the room and involved in the process right from the get-go. So we want to actually build trust in our ability to deliver um, what he needs from the software. And more generally, that's always a part of our role in any agile engagement, is to actually help people engage with the agile process that are new to it. And what that can mean is just actually helping people to understand the process we go through in terms of prioritizing what needs to be delivered. So our documentation artifacts are up on the walls of the room. So if you look here at this uh, overview of the functionality um, that different users of the system are going to need, how they're going to interact with the system. Out of this, we want to actually build software at each stage through each sprint that the customer or the product owner decides is actually valuable. So from these designs, we will produce a prioritized backlog of user stories which describe the functionality of the solution and we deliver the priority features first. And this kind of ties in with our uh, concept of a minimum viable product. So it's about actually what's the smallest piece of functionality that we can deliver to prove or disprove assumptions about a business idea. So we want to deliver software that's valuable 
but it has to actually be delivered often and actually working and done. So it needs to actually meet um, what we call the definition of done, that we actually agree, and that's going to be reviewed and signed off by the product owner of the software. And it actually says, yes, this feature is shippable. So if you think about these stages of stepping through each one of the sprints, and over the courses of the eight weeks of this alpha, um, we were talking about three two-week sprints. So if you think at the end of sprint one, as part of the scope, we want to deliver integrating two data sets. We want to include some basic matching and validation, and we want to actually get the results of that aggregation out onto a dashboard running on a laptop. And then as we move through subsequent sprints, we want to refine that. We want to actually build on those core features and move towards delivering what we set out in the alpha vision by the end of sprint three, which is a fully functional set of dashboards accessible on a mobile device. And ultimately, what we're talking about is, is about these guys. So the actual responders on the ground. And can we produce, during the scope of this alpha, a piece of software which actually delivers real value to the guys on the ground in the emergency scenario. So a part of that process is um, what we call regular show and tells. So this is a way to involve everyone who has a stake in the delivery of this piece of software right through um, from the start of the process to the end. So this is actually set up in the development room, the development team's room in the Surrey County Council offices. So it's, it's really an opportunity for the development team to regularly show off the progress that they've made, the features that they've delivered, but it's also an open invite. So in the room here, we want to have um, people from the fire and rescue service, uh, from the emergency response team, people who have an interest in the governance and provenance of the data. So basically anyone who wants to find out what we're doing and anyone who actually wants to contribute uh, with their own ideas and opinions and criticisms so again, this kind of nicely illustrates uh, our working environment. So if you look at the walls of the room here, you'll see, you know, again, the design artifacts, our product backlog. So anyone who's involved in these sessions can actually get a view by going up to the wall, just looking at the stories that we have in the backlog, what work do we currently have in progress, and what have we done. And we very much encourage anyone who comes along to these, you know, to take a post-it note, to just write down um, on that, kind of features that they think uh, the solution needs to have um, and just go and, go and stick it up on the whiteboard. And all that is stuff you know, that we will actually consider then going forward into future sprint planning. If it doesn't fall within the scope of the alpha, that's fine. It's something we can potentially take forward uh, into a beta phase. But really the key point is that this is a, uh, you know, an open process that people feel they can contribute to. As part of each sprint, um, you know, we treat the Agile process as one of continuous improvement. So it's a process that evolves and it's not an actual set in stone set of commandments. So we evaluate at every stage what works and what doesn't. So at the end of each sprint, we will review, you know, what did we do well, what didn't we do well, things that we might do differently, um, and the issues that we still don't have a complete understanding of, that we need to go away and see what other stakeholders do we need to engage to better understand um, what we need to achieve. And so this process evolves over each sprint. Um, and really it's about embracing change. So the second key point, as well as um, a user-driven um, development process, is um, that actually data is absolutely key to the success of this project. And this is something that we see repeated in the types of projects that our um, data analytics team would typically be involved in, where it slightly varies from uh, the focus of a typical agile engagement, and that really affects our approach and focus on how we deliver. So again, uh, the first step in this process is really to assess what we call the data landscape. So this is where we, um, along with the customer, actually look at what data is out there and available. What data falls within the scope of the alpha? So as part of this, we're looking to assess um, the different priorities of these data sets. We're looking to assess maybe what their quality is, their size. Um, uh, we also look at the owners. So who are the actual people that we need to engage with um, and bring into the process to work with this data? Because they're going to know the data better than us and better than anyone. 
and, and we need them really involved in the process to help us address issues of quality, how we're going to merge this data, how we need to validate it. And that's really key, yet again, to the success of this process, is how we prioritize this backlog of data sets. And really this forms the first part in what we call a data analytics pipeline. So this is a clear, well-defined set of steps that we would see as being common across most engagements. So across the scope of any given sprint, we would expect to cover most, if not all, of the steps within this pipeline. And really, if you break this down into two sets, the first five steps in this process are about putting in place an actual foundational platform for the data. So we move through what I've already talked about, actually identifying the data that we need to integrate into the process, how we actually go through acquiring that data, how we need to filter and extract it, uh, what criteria we will need to apply to um, validate that data, to cleanse it if necessary, and then to actually put it into an appropriate model um, that can be used to serve uh, the bottom three elements of this pipeline. So actually being able to provide meaningful analysis on the data. How are we actually going to visualize this appropriately for different sets of end users? And how are we going to utilize it? And as well as end users, we're looking at really to build a data product. So can this data be used to actually serve other systems? Are there other pieces of integration um, or data quality that this process can actually help to serve and address? And really the final point about how we work is that we very much um, do not deliver in isolation. So we work together as a single unified team and we work in close concert with the customer, with suppliers, as a partner. So success is achieved in close collaboration um, with all those parties. And we really see ourselves as technology enablers. So we take a platform-centric approach. We assess each layer in the data architecture. So we look at everything from appropriate hosting, uh, storage through to data integration, all the way up to visualization. And at each of those layers, we want to actually pick the best of breed components for each of those different layers. So what's actually most appropriate for the needs of the customer? You know, we're not offering um, a pre-canned, one-size-fits-all solution, which is really key uh, when you're dealing with sensitive data uh, of the nature of what we're dealing with with Surrey. So just to give you an idea of the overall solution architecture for what we delivered as part of the alpha, now this diagram illustrates the different functional components of the solution. So this really was our vision for an extensible platform to integrate data uh, and to serve it out to the end users, to the responders. So the core of this solution is based on Cloudera's distribution of Hadoop, or CDH. And CDH offers us an open source data storage and processing platform. So it's highly flexible. It allows us to you know, integrate with all manner of different data sources as required. So we can ingest from uh, relational databases. We can ingest from files. We can integrate with the cloud. We can bring together all these different data sources that potentially have different standards, different formats. And then once they're actually um, integrated into the, uh, the core platform, we can use uh, a tool called Pentaho Data Integration, or PDI, which actually provides the overall orchestration for those data pipelines. So Pentaho Data Integration is a uh, drag and drop visual designer for building data flows. It allows us to integrate to each one of those data sources to build pipelines that can merge and match the data, provide data cleansing, uh, validation, and to actually get that data into a single consolidated cleanse set that can be used um, to serve out to different business intelligence tools or modeling tools. So within the scope of the alpha for Surrey County Council, um, this was ClickSense. So ClickSense is a data discovery uh, and storytelling uh, business intelligence tool. And really, um, this was used to deliver mobile dashboards out to the responders in the field. And I'll come back to ClickSense uh, later during this presentation to walk you through some of the dashboards to show you the kind of things that we actually developed. The key point here is that Cloudera, because it's based on open standards, allows us to plug in different business intelligence tools, different modeling tools um, further down the line as requirements change. 
So each of the components that we've specified as part of this architecture are enterprise ready. So that means ability to integrate with existing identity providers, configurable security and access control at each layer of the solution. So whether that means actually being able to control access to directories um, and data files within the core data platform itself, um, controlling the output of invalid data back to different data source owners, and actually controlling access at the dashboard level. So who has visibility um, over certain parts of the end product data set. And really the foundational component in all of this is a secure infrastructure platform. And that is provided in this case by Skyscape's IL2 compliant infrastructure environment. So given the sensitivity of the data that we were dealing with, the foundation really had to be a platform that had a proven track record uh, securing and managing sensitive UK citizens' data. And by basing it on a cloud platform, it also allowed us to meet another key uh, constraint of this scenario. And it's that the scenario actually dictates that we are able to provision and deprovision this environment at short notice in the time of crisis. So an elastic infrastructure model uh, really allowed us to deliver on that point. I'm now going to briefly hand over to Logan, who will be able to tell you a little bit more about the secure cloud platform um, and Skyscape's cloud services offer. Thanks, Tom. Uh, I'm Logan Seeley, the local government lead from Skyscape Cloud Services. As the name suggests, we're a cloud services company, uh, but we're a little bit different. We were built from the ground up in 2011 to support the UK government's digital by default and cloud first agendas. Our goal is to challenge the incumbency of the inflexible and monolithic suppliers, not just to stir them up, but to really shake them up. And to do this, we provide the UK public sector with an assured cloud platform that is fit for purpose, flexible, and cost effective. It is easy to adopt, but it is just as easy to leave. Our cloud platform is designed specifically for the UK public sector, which means we keep an acute focus on providing the high levels of security and assurance required when working with government and citizen data. This makes our cloud suitable for hosting the diverse range of application workloads we see across local government, health, police, blue light, as well as central government, where we've been helping to deliver digital innovation for over three years now. As well as working directly with public sector organisations, our other route to market is via our partners today, which includes 160 organisations, large and small, and that's growing every month. Kanos is one such partner who we've worked alongside in many government projects. And it was Kanos who introduced us to Surrey about two weeks or so before the first development sprint was due to start, as they had made the decision to look at external parties to help accelerate the delivery of this project. Because our infrastructure is available immediately, the alpha development could start without delay, which was crucial to the type of time scales that Tom has described. So the first consideration for Surrey was uh, security and information assurance. Um, as Tom talked about, because the project was working with data about vulnerable adults, components of which this considered to be quite sensitive. Surrey's security team needed to be satisfied that a cloud solution was not going to introduce the risk of, to confidentiality, availability, and integrity of the data. So the first port of call was due diligence into Skyscape's suitability for hosting this data. We were quickly able to satisfy the Surrey's team in this area by sharing with them our evidence pack. Uh, it's a series of documents that includes our accreditations, uh, including um, CSG, PSN, N3, Cyber Essentials, but also to go through with them our platform architecture and a demonstration of how our people and processes adhere to the ISO 2701 standards, for example. With these while these discussions were happening with Surrey, uh, at the same time, Kanos was working with us to produce the cloud infrastructure design, and we were able to quickly show back to Surrey the expected costs for the duration of this project. Because our compute and storage is charged by the hour and is elastically provisioned, Kanos was able to minimise the infrastructure costs for developing the minimum viable product. And they could do this by only deploying what they needed as they needed it. They could start small and ramp up along with the development effort. Uh, would you be able to change the slide, Tom? Thank you. So as well as the cloud solution being cost effective, it, it also gave Surrey 
the flexibility to, to turn off the service at any stage or, or adapt the service to meet a change in requirements mid-project. And being an experimental project, uh, as I understand from speaking with sorry, this was a significant factor uh, in removing risk associated um, with, with guessing what they thought they might need and locking themselves um, into something that might not be fit for purpose down the line. So, so overall, from start to finish, um, the engagement was around about two weeks after being introduced. And in that time, we were able to gain approval from the Surrey security team, complete the setup of the G Cloud framework contract, set Surrey up with self-service access to the Skyscape portal so that Kanos engineers could start deploying their analytics infrastructure. So Skyscape solution met Surrey its needs in this situation um, by providing immediately available virtual infrastructure that met the strict requirements around security and information assurance, by allowing flexibility to change course at any stage. And by that I mean flexibility to scale out, flexibility to build additional services into the, into the, uh, the product like PSN or N3 access for example, and also flexibility to be able to walk away at any time. Uh, and lastly, the pay-as-you-go consumption model um, enabled them to keep the, the costs to a minimum. I'll hand back over to Tom. <clears throat> Thanks, Lauren. So, kind of everything we've talked about up until this point has really been focused on um, both the data, the platform, actually putting together uh, the framework in order to actually integrate this data uh, and to get it into a form where it's usable. What we're going to talk about now is kind of the end result of all that. What did we actually produce uh, that was usable by the end users of this system? So what did we actually develop in ClickSense to serve this data to the responders? <coughs> Excuse me. So first of all, we're going to take a look. This is the uh, summary statistics dashboard that we developed. And um, this is kind of really a key part of the process. So what this dashboard illustrates is metrics about the actual success of the process itself as it ran. So it gives you measures on the actual number of records that were ingested as part of each data source. It gives you uh, metrics about the actual um, you know, success rate of our sanity checks, how many records passed the full validation, how many addresses were we able to match where we could actually bring back uh, usable coordinates to plot this data on an interactive map. And the, the, like I say, this kind of really became a key part of the process as we moved through to the final sprint, is this ability to create an actual feedback loop for the source system owners to allow them to improve data quality in the source systems. So we, if we're ingesting a data source um, that has a high number of failures in terms of the validation that we check, that we, we need to actually match addresses, then it's crucial that we can actually feed that information back to uh, the owners of those source systems so that that can gradually be improved over time uh, through subsequent runs uh, of the solution. So yet again on security, this is a heavily redacted screenshot, but uh, this is really the core of the alpha. So this is the actual unified vulnerable persons list that in the alpha vision we really wanted to set out to supply. So what this is is a list of addresses it's deduplicated individuals. So this provides drill through functionality so that you can actually click on an address and examine um, the individuals who are occupying that address. And the key point about this dashboard was the value add we could actually add in to the core data sets. So if you look at the uh, persons list on the bottom of this dashboard, you'll notice that we have a series of flags. So we have flags that indicate whether a person has a carer, whether they have an auditory or visual impairment, or whether they have a mobility impairment. And this set of custom flags was really our um, goal was to enrich the data set. And it gives a more complete view of the individuals than the source data sources alone could readily provide um, without you know, a lot of manual effort. So for example, if we took mobility impairment, um, you know, that could mean a number of different things based on the data that's available in the source systems. So does this person exist on a critical equipment register? Are they receiving uh, meals and wheels? You know, so there are a number of different factors that we wanted to feed into these rules 
to actually provide responders with more um, high fidelity information uh, on the ground as part of this data integration exercise. And finally, the third component um, to our dashboards was the interactive map. So we wanted to provide uh, you know, an interactive map on a mobile device that would give people really all of the standard functionality that they're used to um, you know, using other services like Google Maps. So the ability to actually filter by postcode and location, you can see here an example of uh, the lasso tool to actually be able to you know, interactively select different areas uh, of interest, uh, to zoom in on that. And as part of this, we also provide visual indicators um, about the numbers in different locations. So here we're varying the size of the pins, varying the color based on properties like um, the number of vulnerable persons in a particular location. So it gives, gives a kind of very good high level snapshot um, that responders can use to, to assess uh, numbers in different areas. And finally, uh, in conjunction with the dashboards, the, the other key part of the solution that we wanted to deliver um, by the end of Sprint 3 was integration to the actual fire and rescue service system itself. So we collaborated with um, the fire and rescue service to produce a feed that could be uploaded into their existing mapping systems in the actual fire engine cabs. So there are a number of key benefits to doing this. One is that it aids immediate response to situations in the field. The, the responders are actually able to combine the data that we're providing with existing information that they would be able to access in the existing system. So things like flood risk, like known locations of equipment such as oxygen tanks, and um, really also the ability to cope uh, in situations where uh, there's network inavailability, um, which is highly probable in the event of a disaster scenario. So. I've covered really all of the key points of the functionality that the team were able to deliver over the three uh, two-week sprints as part of the alpha phase. I'll now hand back over to Mark, who will talk about some of the benefits of this solution and um, where we go in future. Thanks, Tom. There's nothing more interesting than a, uh, than a user experience screenshot that's been redacted with grey blobs, but, um, but we can't obviously show the personal data. Um, so I want to I want to split the, the benefits that we've achieved through this system into two parts. Um, there are a number of business benefits, obviously, because the system is looking to meet a very real need about um, how us and our partners can respond to emergency situations. Um, so, firstly, in, in terms of accuracy of the data, what we were able to do was um, validate our data from different partners against a known true data source, which is the uh, Ordnance Survey Address Database. Um, so that we know that we're getting a good match on people. Um, so the, in, the, the accuracy of the data was improved just through that prototype that we talked about. Um, the time to aggregate that data has gone from, I, I did mention that it was a best practice process and it can be done under an hour, but the time to aggregate um, the, the four different partners that we put together was a matter of minutes once we got it up and running in the, uh, in the infrastructure. Um, so, in terms of supporting our flexible responses, that, that's, a, that's an important thing because we need to be able to cut and recut data and look at data from different angles to be able to uh, respond to changeable situations in emergency scenarios. Um, so we managed to take some of that effort out and, and in doing so, in providing a, um, for that flexible response, we've provided a tool that doesn't dictate a business process but can flex to accommodate the business process that is agreed between Surrey and its partners in terms of how we process data and how we respond to these scenarios. Now from an approach side um, of taking this approach with Kanos, um, this is a new method of delivery for us and it, it, it has had its own benefits in, in its own right. So from a platform perspective, we're exploring capabilities of new technologies and, and, and big data technologies to see what we can do in that area. Um, and we hope to, you know, that we can use those capabilities, maybe not the exact system, but we can use those capabilities to expand out into other areas. In terms of working with partners, it's a difficult thing when you're dealing with information sharing projects and things are agreed at a very minute detail about how things will be managed. So having a prototype system that you can take and engage with partners, um, particularly uh, our partners in the NHS, shows the real value that we can add in these scenarios and that can be added to the, the process of how we pull that information together. 
So having that prototype um, between the alpha and our next phase has been an invaluable thing. In terms of the architecture, Logan's mentioned a number of the flexibility um, benefits of that. Um, particularly when we started this out as a new piece of technology, we didn't know what the system was going to look with, like. We have our own data center capabilities, um, but being able to flex quite readily to the needs of the development team uh, and working with a DevOps embedded within the development team, we were able to have that flexible architecture with the Skyscape uh, provision. We also know that having done risk assessments on the Skyscape scenario, the, the security is sound for what we were doing for the development, but we also know that there's there's scope within the security they can provide for as we bring on other partners and the demands that they may bring, we can flex that infrastructure to match. So the architecture was a, a key point to that, both in terms of security and growth. In terms of the next steps, uh, we're going through the procurement for the beta phase at the moment. Uh, we're looking at using the digital services framework, which is provided by Crown Commercial Services. Um, it's a new area for us in its own right, so it's placed with its own challenges. It will be an open competition for the developers, and part of the benefit of using open source technologies means that we can keep that competitive element. Obviously, we're very focused on including more data sources into the system moving forward. So we're looking to include the rest of the districts and boroughs who uh, have been involved but haven't yet provided data, and particularly working with our NHS partners in the community to, um, to be able to respond to these emergency incidents. And really, the rest of the, uh, the, the benefit beyond that is looking more to the future and being able to explore the data in terms of how we respond to emergency incidents, but also, as a capability, being able to look at proactive data solutions and being able to look at intelligent analytics going forward um, and predictive analytics about how we move things forward. And with the infrastructure being hosted in the way it is uh, um, on a call-off basis, um, we've got the ability to move that infrastructure somewhere else if we need to. So if we wanted to bring that back in-house to our own data center, once we've got a finalized system, then we can do that. So we'll review the infrastructure towards the end of that beta phase. So really, we're, we're using this technology to meet an existing need um, and, and providing a tool so that we can meet those actions in terms of the review from the flooding that we talked about at the beginning. And, and a flexible response to helping vulnerable people in times of critical emergency. We've already shown a number of the benefits. Um, we're exploring more capabilities about how we can take that even further. Um, and, and really, I hope that the procurement um, for the beta will be with Swift and we'll move into having a live system ready for this winter period in case the same thing happens again. So I think we're going to move to some questions now. Which, uh, so I'll hand back to Tom for that. Thank you, Mark. We're now going to begin answering the questions submitted in today's presentation. As a reminder, you can still submit questions through the questions pane in your attendee control panel. Thank you. Okay, so I'm just going to read out some of the questions here now. Uh, okay, so okay, so I've, <clears throat> I've got kind of two questions along a similar vein here, which is um, really around describing how this could potentially be rolled out to other councils or unitary authorities, um, or is this being shared with other councils? Um, so just to, I can take that one initially. So there are a number of factors here which we think are uh, probably have applicability outside of the, the specific scenario described for Surrey. And if you look back to that original um, alpha vision statement that I talked about, one of the key parts of that vision statement was um, around actually flooding in the first instance. So it was always um, something that was uh, in our minds right from the get-go that although we were focusing on a point solution for flooding in the first instance, um, you know, there were going to be other potential emergency scenarios um, or other scenarios where this kind of data integration exercise that we could spin up was going to provide value. So, you know, sensitive data, um, immediate identification of individuals that's reliable and accurate, you know, that there's potentially um, big cost savings there. Um, so, you know, outside of vulnerable persons, you know, um, we've, we've touched on issues like troubled families, um, vulnerable children, other similar domains, um, which could present similar challenges, um, you know, and potentially similar objectives for this type of solution. Um, Mark, do you have anything you'd like to add to that one? 
Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking a little bit beyond um, just the immediate replication of the use. So, so as I said, we've met, we provided a system that provides for a tactical scenario. Um, we also think that um, what we're investigating, sorry, is, is the model of information sharing and this use of data in how we can move towards integrated social care and health records in the future. So that's a big demand on both the health services and on social care departments in county councils um, and unitary authorities. Um, and so we're looking to take some of the learnings from this project in terms of how we can move into other needs for local government and um, the health sector. Okay. So uh, just looking here, there are a few other questions again along a similar vein um, around strategies used to ensure buy-in between the key stakeholders of the process um, and also about how an initial business case uh, was developed to take this approach. This is maybe one for you again, Mark. Okay, so in terms of engaging the stakeholders, um, there are a number of relationships obviously built up between our emergency management team and the different partners involved in this um, already. So wherever possible, we try to invite them along to the prototype development to get their input into, uh, or key members of staff, um, to get their input into how the, the development was done. Uh, we invited them to show and show and tells, um, and then we've had a kind of a uh, since the prototype's been developed, we've had a, a period where we've added some structure and more formality around the project in terms of what we're looking to deliver for the next phase. Um, and we recognise the key partners that we need to make this an operational system, so we're, we're actively going out and meeting those partners, being able to demonstrate a live prototype system to them and show that value. Um, to get their buy-in and to encourage them to give us their requirements quite early on in terms of what they would need as uh, assurances from an information governance or security perspective so that that can be built into the beta uh, phase of development rather than waiting for us to develop it and expect that functionality to be there. Um, so that's happened throughout the different levels of the different partners from chief executive level down to information governance um, and involving people within IT who, uh, who all have a, a say in that process or all have a role in terms of responding to these scenarios. Um, so that's kind of how we've looked at um, engaging the stakeholders. Uh, the business case itself is obviously in terms of how we could provide something in terms of a tool to be able to meet those uh, that review from the flooding uh, that we had. Uh, it was such a massive event for Surrey that there were some actions within that review that needed to be met. And um, this was an iterative process of being able to uh, work out what that action actually meant while we went through the prototype. And obviously, by, by clearly separating out a different alpha and a beta phase, you could see the su success of that. Um, and if there wasn't the value at the end of the alpha phase, you know, we could walk away and say that we've, we've, we've had a go at it, but um, without having to spend the amount of money we would need to get an operational system in place. And I guess that's the benefit of taking an agile approach in this scenario. Okay. Uh, so another question here uh, along more technical lines, um, which I can answer, is what happens when there's issues with the mobile network uh, during an emergency? So I kind of touched on this. This was really, um, again, something that was kind of in our, in our minds, um, you know, right from the start of this engagement was that within the construction, of the emergency scenario uh, that was described, you know, we needed to provide a system that could, could actually provide value in that scenario. Uh, so that was really the key goal of um, collaborating with the fire service uh, on a system which could actually provide um, a feed out to that existing system so that that could then actually be um, cached on the devices in the truck. So you know, we were able to actually supply that feed. It would then be loaded up into that system, um, and within the fire truck, it could be retained there. So we had that capability for offline access, um, potentially baked in. And let's see another question. Okay. So uh, yeah, a few just around a similar theme again, which is. Uh, the actual challenges experienced gathering and amalgamating the data sets. Um, so probably the first thing there is actually um, the sensitivity of the data yet again. So we managed this using the IL2 data centers. Um, we adhered to our own strict quality processes, uh, which you know is set under our ISO accreditation. 
So that's actually um, working with the district and borough team members across the, the county, trying to understand the data and then how we can actually securely access that. So we have a um, secure bunker system that we can use to ensure that data is encrypted and transferred point to point um, securely. So that's one issue. Uh, data quality certainly uh, is another issue, and I kind of touched on this around the uh, the overall statistical dashboard, which was about uh, including the feedback pipelines back to the source system owners. So what that looked like was actually a file which contained records which failed validation for some reason, so that that could actually be um, transmitted back to the owner, uh, and then they could actually look within their own system about whether there was a problem there that actually needed to be addressed. Or whether actually, as you know, transpired a few times, uh, is something we actually need to address in our system to cater for um, an edge case. Um, so I guess I can put that to Logan or Mark if you have anything you want to add around that. Just the challenges around the data, uh, handling the data. Um, uh, it's it's Mark. I'll, I'll add something to that in terms of. Uh, um, in the initial instance, obviously, we're getting data in and exploring what we could do with that to bring it into the system. Um, a key part for the next phase of the development will be to ensure that we can bring new data sources in much more easily that may not require the support of a developer. Um, so that will either be having a, a schema set up that will allow us to um, import new data sets, or it will be um, having some functionality built within sort of some super users who were able to understand the data set and bring that into the system moving forward because we could you know we can expand we've, we've identified the priority data sets but we can also expand this out beyond that um, to, to include more data from other willing partners who are, are prepared um, under the um, civil contingencies act to help us respond to these scenarios. So I think we've probably time for one more question. Um, so this will probably be the last one. Where are the staff, stakeholders, and users um, given an Agile training session to familiarize themselves with the Agile process uh, prior to the sprint starting? Uh, or was it more on the go Agile training for them? Um, so delivering uh, minimum viable products is a different situation to what most stakeholders would expect. Uh, so again, probably another one for you, Mark. Just initially, I can add to that one as well. Yeah, so within Surrey County Council um, and our development team, we've been looking at Agile uh, delivery in um, a couple of projects, um, but obviously that's quite isolated in terms of people that get exposure to that because they're involved in those Agile projects. And so getting Kanos in was a very different approach for us, and it was definitely a more on-the-go type Agile training. Um, it came with its own challenges in terms of getting stakeholder buy-in, um, because particularly you know in the areas of emergency response, people like to see things written down very clearly before they enter into them. Um, and that, that has been a challenge and so having the break between the alpha and the beta phase um, has allowed us to review that kind of process, look at some of the benefits of that, take the learnings from that agile approach and put together a very you know a clear scope that the key stock stakeholders are happy with in terms of where we're moving to the next phase of the project and they understand that within that the detail may change but the objective of the next phase will be quite clearly set out in terms of what we're looking to add to the system. Um, so, And the benefit then of the Agile is that they know we're looking at a finite amount of time. We know we've got a very clear objective to deliver in terms of a minimum viable product um, to make it an operational system and they know the high level scope that we want within that. Um, but they're, they're now you know, brought onto the fact that within that there will be elements that may change throughout that process and the features may um, look slightly different to how they envisage them at the start. Okay, so I think that's well, maybe just time for one, one final question. So this will be the last question, which is just um, how many data sets have been included so far? So uh, in total there were four data sets. So um, our original target as part of the, uh, the Alpha Vision was to include three data sets. So in, in the end, that was four, four data sets included. So we had four data sets from um, three different partners, um, just to make that slightly clear. Right. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Thomas, Mark, and Logan, and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar, Delivering Cloud-Based Agile Analytics with Surrey County Council in just eight weeks. If you have any other questions, please contact marketing at knos.com. Once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation, and we would appreciate if you would complete that and provide your feedback. You will also receive a follow-up email within 24 up to 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. On behalf of Kanos and our presenters, thank you for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your day.